discovery, go at throttle up. Discovery, go at throttle up.
Fellas, I can change the music if you want. Guess what's coming? Open wide! How much do you think Microsoft Windows is worth? Wait just one minute before you answer. And listen to this incredible music. Windows, 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 Nice 2008 humor, real funny. Yeah. Hey, 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 serious, hey, serious, hey, serious. You know what else is funny? Removing your ability to talk. <laughs> Good. Oh. I love this company. Yeah. All right. How do you feel about the Mustang sedan? I liked it better when, you know, the Ford or Mustang was just called a Ford Falcon. Just saying. Easy win. If you want to make Ford or Mustang, just make Falcon or Fairmont. Or something. This is, this is not complicated. You just bring that back. It would work. Just saying. There's rumors of one, all systems. Does the garage still exist? Yep. I'm just finishing getting all the paint off of those headlight bezels for the Camaro. How about a Mustang wagon? Uh, um, just... They already made that. They already made that, like... Like, 60 years ago. Hedge stream hey streamer from Dan Mark. Who's Dan Mark? What about Mark Mark Ass? Need some wood trim? I didn't get you you couldn't get wood trim on the uh on the smaller ones. You, you, that would be the the country squire, which was here. Seriously, you want you want you want the wood trim, you need Discovery, go at throttle up. The country squire, which is a, a fair lane. Bigger. Couldn't get wood trim on the on the small one. Sandblaster cabin the sandblaster cabinet from Harbor Freight. Got mine looking great on your 84 Camaro. Oh. Yeah, I was thinking about it, dudes, but I uh yeah, I didn't have a lot of you know, a lot of time this weekend. Didn't have a lot of time. Also, I want one of those. Yeah, I want one of those. That would be really cool. Rose. Bring back the Ranchero. Yeah, I'm just saying. How about a Chinook racing a speedboat on fucking Dumpert? Dumpert? Oh my goodness, Dumpert still exists? Yeah, I can't listen to that because, uh, you know. Hello, your girlfriend's currently building STS-31 in Lego on my table. Uh, the space shuttle, yeah, I got you. I use the crap out of the Sandblaster, it's been a great purchase. I think it might be time, Sammy. The problem is I don't really have much space. I gotta... We got, we'd have to shuffle a lot of equipment around in the garage. I think I got an idea about what I want to do, though. Anyway, sorry, guys. I'm nursing a nice 
nice headache right now. Uh, but yeah, so if I'm like, it's uh, yeah, not 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 going great. Anyway, um, we do have a. I didn't realize this until like the last, the absolute last minute. Um, there's a Polaris Dawn press conference happening in about 30 minutes. So we got that. Had to put it on a folding table from Sam's Club outside. Ah, yeah, yeah. Did you happen to watch that 460 video? Mild Mods had it at like 550, 500. I did watch it. Yeah, yeah. The boosted application made like 700 foot pounds of torque. But 500, 500 is very nice. It's 15. They moved it up. Polaris Don Crew has arrived at Kennedy Space Center. We'll start today's press briefing around 1245. Oh. All right. There's a NASCAR race going on with Chahase Elliott. They're at Michigan. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, we got about 15 minutes. So how's everybody's weekend? Everybody's weekend good? And LaJoy decided to flip his car. Yep. <laughs> Lupus would be very happy with 500 torques. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be, uh... We still need that overdrive, though. No matter what, man. We gotta get that gear vendors. What's on the uh, table for launches this week? I just wanna look. Goatman the second. What's up, man? Wait, aren't you over in YouTube chat usually? <laughs> I hope they perform the spacewalk. Some small problem could prevent the entire operation. Yep, yep. Too good. Bachelor party, you're moving slow today. Yeah. Yep. Weekend was good. Cool. Played some KSP this weekend. Found it difficult to land a plane. It happens. Going to Michigan this Wednesday. Going to the Detroit Zoo. Cool. De Detroit Zoo. That's what I'm saying. OD first, then power. Yeah. Get that gear vendors. Put that thing in there, man. And we're set to jet. I sat on your, you sat on your butt and play video games all day? Nice, nice, nice. So we got at 5.30 in the morning, and then at 4.30 in the morning. And then at 340. Why? 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 Why do you do this? Wait, Polaris Dawn's launching on Monday at 338 in the morning. Uh Hey, they're all week they want launches. You wanted those, right? I... Uh... Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, okay. Uh, I need coffee. Yep. We need more. We need more freaking coffee. You literally talked about this in the flame trench. Discovery, go at throttle up. We talked about what? Talked about sh shutting up. I'm sure Titan will let you sleep in the next morning. You know, hey, three years. Thanks, man. Spasiva. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, coffee. Coffee and then press conference. The timing of Polaris Dawn and the possible reasons behind it. Did I?
Alex did. Oh. I don't remember that part. I don't remember doing that. Where's the coffee? There's no coffee. I don't have any water up here. They're gonna launch on Monday. We just saw it. So we got we got about a week. I need that I need that coffee IV. I And I don't remember Alex talking about that either, which now I'm like super confused. Is EJ based in the greater Boston area? Yes. Yes. Well, as my No, I don't want to see your ad. Nobody cares about your pod collection, damn it. Seriously though. I gotta show you guys this. I gotta show you guys this. Hold on. You have to see this ad. No, it's not sponsored. I think it's incredibly stupid. Look at this. So it's advertising. This uh, this lady's advertising her streaming setup, right? It's it's advertising the desk. You know, she's like, oh, you can turn it into a hammock underneath it. That's how strong it is. If I tried to do that, that desk would rip itself apart. Yeah. 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 Uh, over two bills. Yeah, I would rip that desk in half. I'm just sorry. I'm just pointing out the absurdity in it. I was. I'm switching over to Starbase Live so I could go get some coffee. Yeah, yeah. You wish, dude. That guy weighs like 120 pounds, dude. You see how small that dude is next to the cat? Don't give me that uplift desk bull crap, bro. Put somebody that's three bills in there, and then we'll talk. I can sit on this friggin' desk. Yeah, yeah, you see how small that dude was? They said, cat, give me a freaking break. Give me a freaking break. You wish your desk could hold that up. Anyway, I don't know why it's playing ads, but uh, not too happy about it. But anyway, uh, yeah, Hobbit Hammock Shack. You see that? You see that crap? Anyway, I'm going to put on SBL real quick. Uh, yeah, this is from my buddies over at NSF. I don't really want to idle SBL too much, but uh, Starbase Live. But uh, yeah, give me give me one second. I'll be right back. I need to go get some coffee.
crap. Crap. I... Ah. They're on the car. They're on the back of the car. Dang it. Dang it! Who put this car here? Ah. All right. All right. Anything going on with Starbase? Cool. Good. Great. Grand. Wonderful. So we got, uh, I got coffee. Now that I've had my coffee, I'm ready to watch radar. Yeah. I can't believe someone put that car there. It's already started. They posted on next that they'll be start. Oh, geez. Yeah. It's ready to go now. All right. Let's do this. Sarah's Dawn crew, Sarah and Anna. Ah, oh, dude, you Each have first. individually contributed to the development of the SpaceX human spaceflight program, especially the Dragon capsule, and provided invaluable experience of training and supporting crews have really contributed in a big way to this mission. But what's really special is the knowledge that they're going to gain from this mission, they can then bring back to SpaceX and share with the rest of the SpaceX team. What a great partnership between Sarah and Anna and the SpaceX team. We'll all benefit from this great endeavor. The crew's going to share with you the details of the upcoming mission, what they've done to get ready for Monday's launch, and what they plan to do on orbit. But before that, I'll give you a little update of where we are right now. The Dragon will be transported to the Hangar 39A today, probably sometime this afternoon. Uh, where the teams will start to make the spacecraft or mate the spacecraft to the Falcon 9 booster to launch Polaris Dawn. Safety is always our top priority, and we will have final checkouts and analysis to complete. The teams have a solid plan to complete all the work prior to the launch, and we will review everything to ensure we are really ready to launch. As such, I want to talk to you briefly about a recent development the SpaceX teams currently worked on and, and, and solved. When we're in the vacuum with 100% oxygen into the spacesuits, we want to eliminate as many flammability risks as possible. It turns out we discovered that in the dry environment there can be static electric discharge, and that could potentially lead to a flammability concern. The teams went in to mitigate that. They've changed procedures, they've changed processes, they've added conductive material, and we are truly ready to go fly. This is an example of one of the many things that we learned on this flight that really haven't been exposed before in EVA suit development. So SpaceX and the teams and the crew, with their help, are continuing to push the envelope of what it takes to go to the moon and Mars. You know, we take the responsibility that we've been entrusted to us to fly the crew and return them safely home. Spaceflight is not easy. Our mission right now is to safely launch Polaris, support their multi-day mission, and return them home to their families and friends. Thank you to all of the SpaceX teams who worked so hard over the past two and a half years to prepare for this mission. This would be not possible without all the members of the SpaceX team. And thank you to Space Florida for helping us hold this hearing today, this briefing today. And thank you for the 45th for our help in the days to come. Jared and the crew, let's hear from you. Thank you. Yeah, baby. What's up, Rook? Thanks, Gers. Appreciate that. Um, so it's been uh, it's been two and a half years since uh, since we announced the uh, uh, Polaris Polaris program and and Polaris Dawn. It's been a really exciting journey of uh, of development and training, and we're gonna we're gonna take you through a little bit of that today. Uh, but first, just thought it would be good to refresh you all on uh, on what the Polaris program is all about. So it's a joint program with SpaceX, as, as Gers talked about. The idea is to you know, develop, test uh, new technology and operations in furtherance of, um, of SpaceX's uh, bold vision uh, to enable humankind to journey among, among the stars. Now, uh, our first mission, which is kind of why we're all here today, um, we are about a week away from our, our first um, launch opportunity, which is, which is Polaris Dawn. And I'll kind of update you a little bit on, 
on some of the, uh, the big objectives of that shortly. The second mission will build off of what we learned from the first. And then the third mission will be the first crewed flight of Starship. I think a lot of you are already familiar with it. That's that incredible vehicle, fully reusable launch vehicle that's being built in Starbase, Texas. Um, have twice the uh, cost of the Saturn V. <laughs> Uh, it could very well be the 737 for human space flight someday, but it'll, it'll certainly be the vehicle that will return humans to the moon uh, and then on to, to Mars and beyond. Now, uh, every one of these missions will be filled uh, with a number of objectives uh, that are meant to, again, uh, accelerate SpaceX's vision to make life multi-planetary. Uh, but you can always count on, uh, just as it is with this mission, that we will use every bit of the time available for science and research um, as well as uh, supporting St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, which we began our journey with uh, during Inspiration 4, raised over $250 million for them. We've raised millions since with Polaris Dawn and will continue to do so throughout the duration of the Polaris program. Um, so with that, let me, uh, let me reintroduce you to Polaris Dawn. So, uh, I'm Jared Isaacman, and I am uh, really, really excited to meet, introduce you to uh, some of my closest friends uh, and crewmates. We spent, uh, you know, the last two and a half years together really becoming a, a family as we got ready for, uh, for this mission. Now, we all have very interesting ties back uh, to Inspiration4, in the case of Kid, even, even prior to that. Um, we built a lot of trust during that, uh, during that mission. I think that allowed us to really hit the ground running, and in, in combination with all the great people at SpaceX really accomplished a lot over the last two and a half years. Uh, so let's let's start with uh, you know Kid Poteet. He is our uh, mission pilot. So he's an Air Force F-16 uh, background. He is a uh, aggressor commander, uh, a weapons officer, a famed Thunderbird combat pilot, and uh, and he's been uh, he's been he was supporting Inspiration Four as one of our mission directors um, you know prior to to now. And then uh, he also we never have smiles. Uh, Anna Menon. Uh, she is our mission uh, uh, special mission specialist and uh, medical officer for Polaris Dawn. So she is a SpaceX engineer. Uh, she's a mission director at SpaceX. So she runs mission control when she's not going to space herself. Uh, yep. Prior to that, she was a biomedical engineer and supporting astronauts on console at NASA. And we have Sarah Gillis. She's Anna has been on core for SpaceX missions, like the people that talk to the astronauts. Lead astronaut trainer. She's trained many of the crews, uh, the NASA crews that have gone to space, including my previous instructor on, uh, on Inspiration4. She also works in mission control as a core or like a Capcom familiar, and she's a very talented musician as well. Um, so it takes a huge team uh, to prepare for a mission like Polaris Dawn and support the broader Polaris program uh, objective. So, uh, we've got an awesome group, uh, many of them here, and many of them actually flew in with us today. So uh, Todd Leif Erickson is our, is our mission director. Sean Stroker Gustafson uh, is our deputy mission director. Um, we have uh, uh, Combo Weeks. She handles all of our science and research coordination. We have John Slickbaum. He's our uh, philanthropy director, all the coordination with St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and their important vision that no child should ever die and on a flight. Uh, I think many of you know, uh, you know John Snap Krause, our, uh, our content director, um, taking all those awesome pictures. We have Sarah Grover, our communications director, and then uh, Casey Phillips, and she's our, our project coordinator. I think more, even, even more importantly to emphasize, there are about 14,000 names that are, that are not on the screen in front of you. Uh, those are all the, uh, the SpaceXers that are, that are going to work every single day trying to make science fiction a reality. Um, it's really awesome and uh, you know, we're the four lucky ones that get to go on this ride, but I, I can't tell you how many teams have been working nonstop for the last two and a half years, you know, building, building a new EVA suit to do a spacewalk and the operations associated with it and the vehicle changes, the Starlink lasers, a bunch of things we're going we're gonna to talk to you about in order to make this possible all you know supporting that kind of bigger dreams that you know maybe not in the not too distant future humans are gonna are gonna finally reach uh, another planet other than our own um, and it's awesome to see every day I've, I've said it many times that um, the journey and being uh, you know the journey leading up to launch and, and being a fly on the wall to the to the history that SpaceX is making is just as good as flying the mission itself 
OK, uh, give you a little bit of the mission overview. Uh, so again, we're just about a week away from our first launch opportunity. Uh, I think we're flying on uh, Booster 1083, which will be its, its fourth flight. Uh, we'll be flying on uh, Dragon 207 uh, on its third flight. This is, uh, if you know the history of it, this is what Crew-1 uh, went to space on. This is what uh, I flew on previously for Inspiration4, and now Polaris Dawn will go on, which is pretty cool. Very low time Dragon, mm -hmm. uh, which, is, which is nice. We will launch from uh, 39A. Uh, we're expecting up to a five-day nominal uh, mission duration. We will launch into a 51.6 degree inclination and an orbital period of approximately 106 minutes, and that does vary based on the, the altitudes that we will be going to. Which brings us to the next point here. We will uh, insert, uh, Falcon will drop us off in a 190 by 1200 kilometer uh, initial orbit. At that point, we will check out the Dragon, uh, make sure it's very, very healthy. Uh, we will pass through the South Atlantic anomaly, and then we will raise Apogee up to uh, our peak, which is 1400 kilometers. Uh, that should uh, surpass the, the Gemini 11 record. Uh, and then after uh, approximately 10 hours, we will lower Apogee uh, to about a 190 by 700 kilometer orbit. And from there, we will, we will remain. We'll conduct our EVA before eventually phasing down and uh, re-entering and splashing down either in the, the Gulf or, or the Atlantic. Now, we do have uh, three launch T-0s. We will eventually down-select uh, the day of the launch. The window uh, first opens at uh, approximately 0330 on the 26th and goes to approximately uh, 0700. Now, um, you know, when you, uh, when you go uh, higher into, into space, there comes with all sorts of potential challenges. You're putting a lot of energy into a vehicle, then you take it out. But there's other, other realities when you're up there, too, which is a completely different micrometeorite orbital debris environment, uh, obviously a different radiation environment. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but Earth does a really good job as objects get closer to it to clean them up and burn them up. But it takes a really long time when it's higher up. So a lot of smart people at SpaceX figured out the optimal times for us to launch, which is why we have that launch window. Uh, and through um, uh, uh, vehicle pointing, so the attitude we're flying at, and then that low 190 perigee, we're able to uh, mitigate a lot of that orbital debris risk during those launch windows. This is, a, this is a policy mission. So then, then just to take you through the uh, Polaris Dawn main uh, mission objective. So uh, our first objective, uh, which uh, should take place during the first day uh, on orbit, um, is, a, hey, uh, is an altitude record. Uh, so again, we'll go up to 1,400 kilometers. This is the farthest uh, humans have traveled uh, since the last time humans walked on the moon more than 50 years ago. And uh, two of my crew members, Sarah and Anna, will be the women who have traveled farthest from the Earth ever, uh, which I think is pretty, is pretty cool. Now, why, why do this, right? Um, as I mentioned before, um, when you go into this environment, you're dealing with totally different realities than, for example, when you would go to the, to the space station. So again, it's a lot of energy going into the vehicle. It's a lot of energy to take out of the vehicle when you come back home. It is a different radiation environment. It is a different micrometeorite orbital debris environment. And we stand to learn quite a bit from that uh, in terms of human health, science, and research. Uh, if we get to uh, Mars someday, we'd love to be able to come back and, and be healthy enough to tell people about it. So I think that's, it's worthwhile to get some exposure in that environment. Also, uh, it informs vehicle architecture because, generally speaking, vehicles don't like uh, radiation. So that's why we're going to stay there for the shortest amount of time uh, that's necessary to gather the data we want, and then we'll, we'll come back down. Our second major objective is uh, the first commercial spacewalk. Uh, in this case, we'll, and we'll take you through it a little bit, we are going to vent the vehicle entirely down to vacuum. There is no airlock on Dragon. Uh, that means all four crew members are exposed to the vacuum of space. Two will remain inside the vehicle, and two uh, in sequence will go outside the vehicle. When we are out there, uh, we're going to make use of uh, various mobility aids uh, the SpaceX team has engineered, and it'll look Policy like mission. we're doing a little bit of a dance. And what that is is we're going through a series of test matrix on the suit, and the idea is to learn as much as we possibly can about this suit and get it back to the engineers to inform future this is a, uh, suit this is a uh, design freaking, evolutions. It's a nutty um, mission. And you know, we do crazy. that. We're, su we're super I proud knowing the massive amount of effort that went into to making these suits. And, and just shortly, um, uh, Sarah is going to take you through what that development process is like. Uh, but it's not lost on us that you know might be 
10 iterations from now and a, a bunch of evolutions of the suit, but that uh, someday someone could be wearing a version of which that, uh, that might be walking on Mars. And uh, it feels, uh, feels like, again, a huge honor to have that opportunity to Super test it out. Super dangerous mission. Um, oh, yeah. So we will learn this as much policy, as we can uh, about that like suit. The uh, entire sick. operation is scheduled to be about two hours. Uh, from venting to repress, yeah, course, we're building totally. a lot of a lot of uh, margin there for for thing anything unexpected Did to go you? on. But uh, actual out of uh, vehicle time, you know, could be uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of you know, um, you know, 15 to, to 20 minutes each um, while we're out there. Um, next, uh, hey, our third objective is we are testing out a new communication system. Uh, this is using uh, Starlink laser link. So there is a plaser that is mounted in the trunk of the uh, vehicle that we will be flying on. What? And through beams of light, it will communicate to other Starlink satellites. And, uh, and this, is, this is pretty cool. It is no uh, small task to have oh, two objects flying 17,500 miles an hour uh, communicating over a, a beam of light. But it has the opportunity to open up an entirely new communication pathway uh, not just for, for Dragon, but for armadas of starships or other satellites agree, or Cloud. telescopes out there and kind of free up some of the burden Monday, on the you know, existing TDRS and, uh, and ground station infrastructure. And then we will, as I mentioned before, use every bit of the time in between approximately uh, to accomplish approximately 40 in science, science and research experiments that, uh, that Anna will take you through in just a minute. Uh, now this slide, just to uh, give you an example, uh, of what uh, depicts the various orbits uh, that we'll be at relative to the International Space Station, Hubble, um, and where we flew previously on Inspiration4. And this very cool rendering gives you and I uh, a little bit of a depiction see? of what the uh, Starlink laser Point communication the at the horizon. Uh, should look like. And do you see that? And with that, I am very pleased Holy to turn it over to Sarah nice. to take us This mission is cool. This is ballsy as hell. I love it. Matt, Ian, what's up, dudes? The mic work is it's ballsy. I love well, it. As Jared mentioned, this You're is obviously a development problem. And that's and taken do a this. ton of work across the SpaceX team in order to support these ambitious objectives. Um, so I'm going to take you through some of the modifications both to the spacecraft as well as the spacesuit. And what you'll see throughout these slides is that much of the development effort has really been focused on safely executing this spacewalk. It's windy. <laughs> um, maybe first, I'm just going to paint a little nice. bit more of a picture of the spacewalk and what to expect. Um, so actually, about an hour onto orbit, we'll start preparations for the EVA, um, where we begin a pre-breathe protocol. And this pre-breathe is really designed to help... Discovery, go at throttle up. Uh, 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 Sarah? T hello? No freaking way. Flight day two will get pressurized in the suits and actually go through a mobility demo where we step through the sequence and movements inside the spacecraft and really make sure there was nothing missed in our training that we're confident before we step outside. Hey, laser. And then flight day three is the spacewalk. Um, so that morning we'll go through system checkouts on both the life support system and the suits before all of us get pressurized on 100% oxygen. We'll complete the final um, pre-breathe on 100% oxygen before we vent the spacecraft. Yep. Once at vacuum, EV-1 oh, will open oh, the hatch oh, space. before uh, EV-1 Thanks, and EV-2 serially will go outside and uh, complete the test matrix that Jared mentioned of suit mobility objectives. Uh, once complete, uh, EV-2 will close the hatch and then we'll proceed with repressing the spacecraft and then continue with the science and research for the remainder of the mission. There's pressurizing the suits so with that So stepping into some the, of the, the spacecraft capsule. side modifications that were needed to actually accomplish this. Bro. Um, one of the more substantial efforts was upgrades to the life support systems. Yep. This includes adding a lot more oxygen to the spacecraft so that we can feed oxygen to four suits through umbilicals for the full duration of the spacewalk. There have been upgrades and additions to the envir environmental sensing suite in the spacecraft to make sure we have really good insight both before, during, and after exposure to vacuum. Pretty sweet. And what you can see here is actually a new addition, an entirely new system, a nitrogen repress system. Um, this is kind of a closeout shroud over two redundant uh, nitrogen tanks that will be used to repressurize the spacecraft um, once we're complete with the EVA. With all of these life support system upgrades, obviously there's a ton Bro. of testing that needs to go into this. And that's both at a component level, but then also at a full scale system level. Um, so what you see here is the Dragon spacecraft actually going into a thermal vacuum chamber, 
um, and we ran the end-to-end -end sequence, both depressing the capsule, dwelling a vacuum, and then repressing the spacecraft using all the software, hardware, and integrated systems that we expect to use for this flight. Um, additionally, at vacuum, we performed a long duration dwell on the interior at vacuum so that we could actually bake out a lot of the materials sure, on the inside, remove some um, chemicals that would off gas in the vacuum of space before we're actually in that environment. There's been a lot of addition of new mobility aids to support suited mobility in the spacecraft. So you're actually looking up through the top of the spacecraft here at what we call the Skywalker. And this is a new structure that's been added outside the forward hatch that we'll use during the spacewalk, um, both as a handhold and footholds uh, for some of the testing we'll perform. There's also new handholds around, both around and on the forward hatch of the spacecraft for interior operations, as well as some new camera views, both on the mobility aid and the nose cone to capture footage during the spacewalk. Um, the forward hatch has also been upgraded to include a motor to assist with hatch opening. Here you can see the Starlink Wi-Fi router inside the spacecraft. Um, and this connects to the laser system that Jared mentioned in the trunk called the plug and laser. You might think getting internet might be as easy as just flipping that switch, turning on your internet, but it's not. Um, we're talking about a laser sending information to a Starlink satellite that is moving at orbital velocity down to Earth and then back again. Um, so it's been an incredible development effort they by the SpaceX the team. Starlink in. And on a personal note, I've taken um, specific interest in this development effort, and we have a special message that we will share with the world using this technology. Did they just, did they just bolt the Starlink into that dragon? Um, so next, getting into uh, what I actually notice is on all of your badges, which I love. What the f what? Um, what? Development of the EVA suit. So here it is. First generation SpaceX EVA suit. And I think it just looks so cool. I know we're all just feel so grateful to be able to test out this piece of technology. I, I'm, I'm OK. So what you see here is a design evolution of the new um, EVA suit. It is a design evolution from the IVA suit, the intravehicular activity suit. And it includes all sorts of technology, including a heads up display, a helmet camera, an entirely ar new architecture for joint mobility. There's thermal insulation throughout the suit, including a copper and indium tin oxide visor that both provides thermal protection and solar protection. Um, and then throughout, there's all sorts of redundancy, both in the oxygen supply feed to the suit, as well as all of the valves, all of the seals across the suit. Um, it's an incredible suit. It's been a long journey to get here. And I'm uh, sure, as you guys know, we didn't start here. This isn't where we began. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of the development journey to get here. Um, so when we first started, we would come in every day for training, and pretty much every single day, we'd walk in and there would be a different suit. It would have a different glove, a different elbow, a different shoulder, and there was this constant iteration of suit components with the suit team to test and collect data. Um, in parallel with that, though, we also had to develop training for the suit. So the SpaceX team didn't have the ability to put this really constantly evolving hardware into a pool. So they came up with a really novel solution of a suspension system that has kind of simulated physics that allows you to pressurize the suit, put on a harness, and actually go through operations as if you are weightless. So it's a really cool analog environment. Um, they created our ability to do this both kind of in a vertical orientation simulator with all of our flight software, all of our vehicle interior, and then also in a sideways configuration that you can see here to support manual hatch operations, all of the tasks we need to perform to get in and out of the spacecraft. Um, so it was this uh, kind of constant iteration with the SpaceX team, both on the training side and the suit side. Well, we went through this progression. Um, you, we went and learned a lot, frankly. Um, you might think that we would be extremely cold out in the vacuum of, of space, and actually uh, we're more concerned about being too warm. So part of the learning we went through um, was trying to understand, quantify the thermal environments, what our metabolic rates will be. So what you see here is us pressurized in a suit. On top of that, you have an 8,000 meter down suit that you wear on Mount Everest. And then on top of that is another 8,000 meter down suit. Um, so we're really trying to create an environment that doesn't have convection, looking at the thermals, looking at what we'll actually experience in these suits. Uh, 
Um, another aspect of de development on this journey, um, as Jared mentioned, since Dragon doesn't have an airlock, the entire spacecraft is going to be going to vacuum. And I mentioned this kind of novel pre-breathe protocol, where we're starting at about 14.5 PSIA and going down to about 8.65 as the last stage of our pre-breathe over a long period of time to slowly pull nitrogen out of our body yep. and reduce our risk of decompression sickness. Yep. Um, to validate this test, we actually spent two whole days in a vacuum chamber at NASA Johnson Space Center, and we went through the entire protocol, um, stepping down pressure and then ultimately performing a simulated EVA on breathing masks of 100% oxygen, um, stepping through the full operation. Um, so here you can see us in the chamber during the simulated EVA transitioning onto oxygen masks. So this was kind of just a very cool ex, uh, experimental validation of this protocol. The final crude test was actually wearing these incredible suits into the vacuum chamber. So we returned to Johnson Space Center and uh, we were in the front chamber or the front airlock of the chamber B. And we went through basically a full depress sequence, dwell at vacuum and repress, um, looking at some of the manual hatch operations in the chamber, but really getting to see firsthand what it'll feel like in the suits as we go to vacuum. Um, so at this point, the suit has gone through an incredibly extensive testing campaign. Um, some of them have been mentioned, but we've covered everything from life cycle testing, pressure testing, MMOD testing, extreme hot and colds testing, an entire campaign on ESD and flammability testing. Um, it's, it's been a really impressive amount of work by the SpaceX team to test this suit for flight. Hey, Zah. Um, as a crew, we've spent probably more than 100 hours in this suit at this point. Um, and here is actually a picture of the final checkout of our flight suits in the flight spacecraft at our test drive. We're really looking forward to testing this first generation of suit. And this is a great visual to kind of show you what to expect for the spacewalk. So with that, I'll hand it over to Kid for training. That wasn't an accident putting the moon hello, in the hello. background. Hello, Kid Poteet, uh, the mission pilot for Polaris Dawn. And as Gerst and uh, Rook mentioned, uh, we've been at this journey for uh, two and a half years preparing for this historic mission. Uh, on a personal level, uh, flying fighter jets in the Air Force for 20 years, uh, combat experience, uh, operational test experience, uh, leading many red flag exercises, uh, fighter weapons school, uh, I can tell you without a doubt, this has been some of the most challenging training that I've ever experienced. And I, I could not imagine a more qualified crew than these three individuals uh, derived from in them charge, getting prepared for this mission. Um, we've been put through the ringer by Melissa, who is our lead trainer in uh, row three. Uh, and it's been an awesome journey preparing for this mission. Um, and it also took, as, as Gerst and Jared mentioned, uh, an entire organization, 14,000 employees, and some of the brightest and smartest engineers I, I've ever met um, have been a part of this. And, and we're just so thankful for what uh, the resources and the, and the time and effort they put into this mission. Uh, as far as the training, uh, there's more or less three uh, objectives. First off, uh, to get us qualified in the operation of this spacecraft. Uh, secondly, um, it's about adaptation to the environment that we're going to live in for five days in space. It's very austere and we've got to get ready for that and there's ways that we do that. Uh, and then third, experiential learning. Uh, uh, setting up those uh, experiences that kind of put us in a, in a scenario that is, uh, uh, allows us the opportunity to get comfortable in an uncomfortable uh, environment and I'll talk about that. Um, to accomplish these objectives, we more or less have three categories. Procedural training, uh, physiology training, and practical training. As far as the uh, procedural training, uh, we spent a majority of our time, roughly about 2,000 hours in the simulator. Uh, we went through extensive academics, uh, uh, all the systems, uh, knowledge of the spacecraft, um, crew resource management, communications amongst the crew, as well as with uh, mission control. Uh, nominal procedures, contingency operations, emergency procedures, all these things uh, culminated with the, the 2,000 hours that we spent in the simulator. Now to put this in perspective, I, I flew fighters for 20 years. Uh, I, I accomplished about 1,500 hours in the simulator training for combat, um, and, and that's over 20 years. This is uh, two and a half years in the making, 
in over 2,000 hours. So it, it's been very extensive, uh, and it's uh, a reliance upon these three individuals to get me through this program. Uh, this is a picture of us in, in the buck, uh, our home away from home. A replication of the capsule, and, and we spent a lot of time going through the nominal and the contingency operations uh, for our mission. Uh, we do that uh, in our normal clothes, and we do it in, in, the, in the spacesuit to replicate uh, what we'll experience on orbit. GoPro. Obviously, uh, Rook interacting with the, with the system. GoPro moment. Uh, more pictures of us in the capsule. And then as far as the uh, physiology training, adapting to the environment that we're going to live in, uh, we accomplish this training through the centrifuge, through the altitude chamber, <laughs> the vacuum chamber, zero-g flights, and it's all to provide, you know, it's, it's very challenging to replicate space on Earth. Uh, but there's yes. certain tools and resources it's, that I we like can utilize to kind of get a feel for it and adapt and build our confidence uh, for those stressors. The centrifuge, uh, similar to what we do in the Air Force, just a slightly different orientation uh, based on the sensation of the G-forces that we'll experience on the way up and the way down. Um, and, and we'll accomplish that in the, in the centrifuge. And it's about four and a half, five Gs on the way up, uh, various transitions as we go through MECO and SECO, uh, ultimately arriving on space uh, and that zero G ex experience. Uh, the altitude chamber. Um, we spent time in there getting familiar with our symptoms of hypoxia, uh, there are various uh, PSIAs, uh, uh, pressures that we'll experience throughout the, um, the pre-brief protocol, the five-phase pre-brief protocol, um, anywhere from atmospheric 14.7, working our way all the way down to when we're at vacuum, we'll be at uh, five PSI in, inside our suit. Uh, all the while, we have different um, uh, oxygen concentration levels, uh, anywhere from 20% all the way up to uh, 100% uh, on the pre-brief. We did the zero-G flights, which are a lot of fun. But again, it's, it's hard to replicate. These are 30-second intervals. So we utilized this opportunity to, to accomplish some of our science and research to see what that would feel like. And we've got to stay healthy. And these two are going to keep us healthy because uh, they're the smartest of the, of, the, of the group. So they went through a very extensive uh, medical training um, at uh, participating in partnered hospitals uh, to get fully qualified to take care of us on orbit. And so the fun part, so we did a lot of practical uh, training, getting comfortable in uncomfortable uh, scenarios. Uh, scuba diving, it's very difficult to communicate uh, when you're underwater. Um, temperature you got to deal with, uh, uh, but it also provides that uh, buoyancy Blance. that uh, can help us train for uh, microgravity when we're on orbit. Fighter jets, that's probably the easiest thing I, I was able to do uh, throughout this two and a half years. Um, why is that important? Well, again, it's, it's uh, a, a little more stressful environment. Uh, communication can be challenging when you're communicating over radio. Uh, close proximity, we're going to build the trust uh, and the confidence that we have in each other. Uh, and then we climbed Cotopaxi, uh, just shy of 20,000 feet down in Ecuador. Ecuador. Uh, so why is that important? Well, when it's a uh, multi-day journey to get to the summit, you're dehydrated, you're hungry, you're grouchy because sleep it sucks. Uh, and, and you learn a lot about yourself under this uh, stressful environment and you learn a lot yep. about each other. Uh, so that was a really good training experience for the team. And we did the skydiving. Uh, we went to the U.S. Air Force Academy and went through their very rigorous uh, program, the only program in the world where your first jump is solo free fall. Uh, so again, that, that kind of took us That's through this uh, very uh, demanding um, uh, training yeah. syllabus in order to uh, skydive and jump out of an aircraft. And this was just uh, some uh, supplemental training, jumping off the uh, uh, high meter platform at the Air Force Academy. Oh, I'd do that. Because we could. That'd be awesome. Yeah, it's your so with that, that I'm going to pass guy. it off to Anna That's for the best. Uh, science and research. Thanks, Kate. So, a beast. as Jared mentioned, science and could. research is our fourth major mission objective. We have partnered with approximately 30 institutions around the world to execute a series of approximately 40 science and research experiments as a part of this mission. They generally fall into three categories. The first category is human health. We are born into 1G when you go into 0G, whether it's for five days or a nine month trip to Mars, things change. You have bone density loss, you have vision changes, you have severe motion sickness, and we don't have answers for all of that. The second category 
is research that can take advantage of the unique mission profile that we are flying. For example, we are doing a spacewalk, and when you do that, you reduce the pressure. With that, just like when you open a can of soda, bubbles are released. So we are using ultrasound Bands. to monitor for those bubbles. The third category involves, you know, there's problems that we face here on Earth, and including when astronauts come back from space, they face challenges upon returning to Earth's gravity. For example, astronauts often experience disorientation and balance issues upon returning to gravity, and we are testing out ways to help with that. So what you see here is that pressure chamber that we're living in for two days that Sarah mentioned. But what's really neat about this is that we had the opportunity to practice a lot of the experiments we will do in space, but while we were also experimentally validating our pre-brief protocol for our EVA. Dude, this is killer. People do this you for a job. You might think that this looks like a flight simulator, but really what it relates to is cognitive abilities. By the time you get to your destination on a mission, be it Moon or Mars, you want to have retained the, the skills that you trained when you left back on Earth. So with the we are X -52 right testing there. out training techniques to help with this. Oh. This is a device that uses blood flow restriction to help improve the efficacy of exercise in space and also helps improve the effects of fluid shifts that astronauts experience when they go to space. We have a number of experiments looking into those eye changes that I mentioned occur for astronauts. One, you can see here, uses this contact lens that we will wear, and it measures intraocular pressure for extended periods of time, and so we can hope to better understand the mechanisms behind these eye changes. Oh, cool, dude. That's so cool. Now, as we look into a future Bro. where there are hundreds or thousands That's of people so living legit, in space dude. for long periods of time, this is so cool. it is only a matter of time before there is a medical Alert. emergency that requires intervention. So we can help prepare for this through experiments like the one you see here. This uses an endoscope or a camera that we will insert through our nose into our airway to gather imagery and look for challenges like inflammation. Now, I mentioned before that Bro, I've seen that movie before. The aliens get you when they the nose. No? All right. Those balance issues that astronauts face when they return to a gravity environment. Here you can see us testing a tool that might help with this. It uses electricity shot between the inner ears to simulate that disorientation and teach more rapid adaptation skills. And then finally, looking into the future, artificial gravity is one thing that could help Are those bowling shoes? make all of these issues go away. But it comes at a cost, and that is severe motion sickness. Yep. But scientists think that when you go to space, you might be less impacted by that disorientation that comes from spinning required for artificial gravity. So we will test that hypothesis. Now, this mission whoa, 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 is testing whoa, 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 technologies whoa, 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 that... Whoa, 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 They're going to induce artificial gravity. Dude, this is a Gemini mission. This is dope. Oh, I love it. I love it. This is great. Please do more contributes to yes. our collective future in human space exploration. Awesome. But we also believe it is important to address the challenges that we face here on Earth today. And one of the ways we are doing that is by raising funds and awareness for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. This is a continuation of what was started on Inspiration4. They raised over $250 million for St. Jude, and we are continuing that. The difference here is that we are taking our message all around the world because Starlink goes all around the world. We took Starlink to the Philippines. We distributed Starlink terminals to hospitals around the world to help support remote medicine capabilities. We are helping to build a new facility to help patients who are undergoing treatment. And then on a personal note, I authored a book named Kisses from Space, and the proceeds from that will go to benefit St. Jude. So here we are, sitting seven days out from our first launch opportunity. What do the days ahead look like? So our major goal is to stay healthy. But we are lucky in that we have a lot to keep us busy and our minds focused and sharp in those days. That includes science and research prep, data collection, some flying, and some of our official duties, including oh, no. launch readiness review and a dry dress rehearsal of launch day in our capsule. But you probably most care about what we will actually do on orbit. So we get to launch. Launch, we get into space in about 10 minutes. 
about an hour after getting there, we will start our, that pre-brief protocol Quick that Sarah Neo mentioned. insertion. You've got to be kidding we me. Will That's ballsy. Soon thereafter, raise that to our peak apogee. Crazy. And while we're there, we will be passing through the inner, re inner regions of Earth's Van Allen radiation belt. This is awesome. And that brings us to flight day two. Flight day two, I will read the book I authored to my family as well as some of the brave patients of St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And then we will lower to our cruise orbit. At that point, we will begin our spacewalk preparations. We will perform that mobility test. We will check out our spacesuits and we will configure the cabin. Flight day three is EVA day. We will wake up, have several yep. hours of preparations, including final cargo configurations, ECLIS checkouts, and preparing biomedical monitoring devices for the spacewalk. We'll don our spacesuits, do a suit leak check, and then perform the EVA. This entire thing will be live streamed, so please join. Flight day four is the Starlink demonstration day. So we will have some <laughs> so checkouts good, and then perform a series of demonstrations as a part of that test. You'll want to stay tuned for this. And then flight day five is our final full day on orbit. This, we will be wrapping up all of that research that we, I mentioned earlier. We do have research weaved in every single day of the mission, but this will be our last day to gather as much data as possible for the scientists back here on Earth. Then we will begin our reentry preparations, and that brings us to flight day six. We will don our spacesuits, reenter through Earth's atmosphere, and then splash down off the coast of Florida at one of SpaceX's seven sites. Haven't when we get back, we will be recovered by the SpaceX recovery vessel, and then we will owe some time to science and research and reconnecting with our families. And then we will be looking forward to talking with all of you again. So with that, we will take any questions you have. Damn, that's so cool. If you could uh, please come up to the microphone, uh, state your affiliation and who you'd like to address your question to. We'll take uh, one or two questions from each, each reporter. That okay. Before we get into the press thing, we'll do it just like we did before. That I'm I, I ain't trying to answer the questions this time though. I don't know that I'm I'm along for the ride with you guys, but holy balls, that's cool. What a crazy freaking mission. This is excellent. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Marcia Dunn AP. Um, NASA has long considered spacewalks the riskiest part of any space flight after launch. How much work went into the suit and the preparation or and to make sure skip. that this was going to be as safe as it it's possibly cursed, man. could. You're right, EVA is a risky adventure. But again, we've done all the preparation. We did the capsule testing. We did the suit testing. We did the uh, hyperbaric chambers. We did all the work to really get ready for this. You know, we kind of built off of what NASA's heritage was, but I think we've also extended NASA's heritage a little bit further. Some of the joints in the suits are much better than, than we've had in the NASA world. Some of the other capabilities, the heads-up display, is also a new, a new thing that's coming into the spacesuit world. So I think it's a really a tribute to this team that they advanced the state of the art, and we're going to do it as safely as we can, and we've got the right protocols, and we've done the right testing to get ready to go do it. Go ahead, Jerry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just to layer onto it. Um, That's right. If you I mean, pause the, the it, it screws EVA up. Is, I'm going to shut up. You guys are right. Probably makes up the majority of the development uh, for Polaris Dawn. Um, I mean, an absolute extensive amount of time has gone into it, uh, so much so that I, I was actually far more concerned. And, and it and is rightfully, why, why would it be the riskiest part? Because you're throwing away all the safety of your vehicle, right? And it now comes down to your suit becomes your spaceship. Um, I'd say, personally, I was almost concerned to some extent that, that we are way too focused on the EVA. What about all the other things? And that's where, you know, in the, in the handful of months uh, approaching, uh, you know, your certification for flight, SpaceX begins all of their paranoia reviews, as, as you would call it, where they look at everything. I mean, start essentially all over again. Um, we, we participate in every single risk briefing, um, you know, some of which was covered in Gerst's initial remarks, like, you know, flammability-related concerns. We were, we were brought out to White Sands Missile Range to see where they do the MMOD testing. So, I mean, the, the, the communication, the transparency with SpaceX from the beginning all the way through the end, especially when I said, like, they literally start all over again to look at every piece of the mission, not just the EBA, is what inspires so much confidence. And in terms of, like, can, can anyone, you know, do this someday, I would actually say, like, it, it, the, the training in the suit was, was super fun and exciting. I think actually where, where it, it might not be for everyone is the, uh, is the development side of it when we're trying different suits out and they're saying, let's, let's try today to see how hot we can make it. 
and put on two 8,000 meter suits. <laughs> That's probably, you know, uh, I know we all found it enjoyable. I don't know if every, everybody would or like, you know, let's see how cold we can make it with liquid nitrogen. Um, so the development side, which is, I, I think, very appealing to us, is, is maybe not necessarily for everybody, but once your suit is good and you're ready to go, um, I imagine, you know, a lot of people someday in the future are going to be, you know, maybe even families bouncing around on the lunar surface in their, in their, EVA, in their SpaceX EVA suits. Certainly possible. Okay. And one quick follow-up. Is SpaceX, did they cover the whole cost of the spacesuit development? I mean, is that all in-house, all the tech that went into that, all the research? I think it's shared across the, the Polaris team along with SpaceX. But again, you know, our company's vision is to make us multi-planetary in the future. So this is an investment in the future. So the company is willing to make those R&D investments to, to get us ready to move human presence beyond low Earth orbit. Jeff Bounce of Space News. A question for Mr. Mr. Isaacman. When you announced the Polaris program two and a half years ago, you were looking at flying this mission perhaps by late 2022. Um, you talk about what things caused the schedule to slip. Um, was it just the spacesuit development or other factors? And what gives you confidence that you are ready to go now at this point? Yeah. Well, I think actually the fact that it has taken two and a half years is where you get confidence. Um, if, it perhaps, if it was the initial nine-month time frame, I think we'd probably all be wondering how, how we were able to work that quickly. Um, <laughs> I would say that this is a, one of the many kind of... Um, you know, philosophies that I've observed at SpaceX that gets people very motivated is you set some very, very ambitious deadlines up front uh, to get people working really hard in the right direction, but there's lots of good sanity checks along the way to say, are we, are we, is this now right or, or should we move it out? So I think it was right in the, in the beginning to say we're going we're gonna to try and achieve this at like, you know, light speed. Um, and uh, and it, it, you can't just point entirely to the suit being a part of it. I mean, the briefings we received from the engineers on the Starlink side were I mean, incredible. Uh, you know, the, the amount of work that goes into it. And I, I think, um, you know, during the launch webcast, they're going to show some behind the scenes from the engineers because I'd never want anyone to just think it is just throwing the on switch on, on say, the internet. That was uh, a massive engineering challenge to solve, as was the suit and the operations to even support the suit. Having a good suit's fine, but you still have to vent the vehicle and repress it uh, so that you don't need to remain in the suit through the duration of the mission. So I, I think there's suck. just a lot of things. A lot. Are ambitious objectives. These are all, and those ambitious objectives came with real engineering challenges, and it, and it took a big organization effort to get there. But as I mentioned before, we were briefed extensively in the months leading up to this through all the para paranoia reviews, the um, flight readiness review that happens a decent while ago, and you're hearing from every engineer, you know, green, yellow, red, how we're looking and being kept informed right up to the end. So that's where you get all the confidence that we're ready. And just to quickly follow up, um, can you give sort of a ballpark estimate of, of how much money you've invested into this program so far? Good Not a chance. Good question. <laughs> Hi, Richard. Nope. Orlando Sentinel. I really am curious about uh, the danger of opening up this spacecraft in space. Not only just the idea of going in vacuum and what are the contingency, I mean, Scott talked about this, the uh, contingency and emergency things. I mean, how many simulations do you go through? Is there a, a a timeline for if there's a major emergency getting back to Earth safely? And uh, is the 700 kilometer uh, orbit uh, more dangerous with micrometeorites and whatnot? So just uh, if, if any of you could speak to that, thank you. They, they answered both of those questions, but yeah, it's all sure. good. Yeah. Contingency. Oh, sorry. Um, so throughout the EVA program um, and the development of this, that that's really where they started with is what are the contingencies we need to plan for and how do we ensure a crew can get home safely? Um, so there's some um, really interesting operations that have been developed, both to ensure we have a good landing site that's within reachable target at the start of the spacewalk, for instance. Um, but we have spent so much time drilling contingency responses, drilling all different flavors of responses we might need to have on the spacewalk. Um, it's as a trainer, I actually think we have used up all the ideas I had at the start of this for what I might want to throw. Melissa's done an excellent job kind of sprinkling in everything she could throw at us at this point. Um, but there's been a lot of work just to ensure we have the right response for any scenario we can think of. Uh, what about the 700 kilometer altitude? I think that our, our orbit was designed uh, to be uh, highly elliptical where at least 
you know, approximately half of the orbit is going to benefit from being a, a very low perigee, um, you know, of 190 kilometers. Um, 700 kilometers at apogee certainly has more MMOD than 190 or 400, but again, the, the T0 times that were picked, um, you know, for this mission is what uh, gives us, you know, the, um, the, the best, uh, the best uh, window to minimize the impact of, of MMOD. Uh, so we feel pretty good about it. And maybe just to add on that, for the spacewalk itself, we'll be orienting the vehicle in a way that shields the crew members. So it's kind of a really clever way of both providing shade through the nose cone and then also additional protection of spacecraft. Uh, just one quick thing. How long is the tether? This is a good question. Oh, uh, long enough to, to get the job done, not long enough to do, you know, the original, uh, you know, depiction of us floating in space, so. <laughs> Hello, uh, Anthony Leone, Spectrum News. Uh, with all the training that you guys have done, was there any part where it made you the most uncomfortable and uh, maybe dread a little bit or maybe make changes to when you're ready to do it for real next week? I'm not sure everyone initially loved skydiving, but we got there. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us aren't used to throwing away a good airplane. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think that, that anything stands funny. out as <laughs> causing us to change our plans. I think they actually just contributed to our learning, our preparedness, um, taught us a, gave us a toolbox of skills that we will use throughout our mission. And I think what's really cool about the development effort is we started with an idea of the operation and then we started testing it and iterating on it. And it was like, okay, we very clearly need a mobility aid to go here. Otherwise, we're not gonna be able to do what we need here. So it, it's, I'd say as we went through training, we were just working hand in hand with the SpaceX team to modify the vehicle and add what we needed when we ran into issues. So it's been a really cool evolution over time. And I think, I mean, spending thousands of hours in the simulator is what helped build our confidence for dealing with any scenario that Melissa decided to throw at us. I mean, it was very challenging, like, like I highlighted in my, in my portion, but um, Experiencing those and trying to identify what is wrong and then how do we work together to solve those issues is, is certainly built our confidence to be able to handle that. Uh, very low probability, but be able to handle that on orbit. Thank you. Hey everybody, I'm James. I'm from Channel 6. I'm a local reporter here in Cape Canaveral. Hey James. I was wondering for Anna and Sarah, from your early days of working on developing Dragon, did you always want to fly on it too? And is your confidence in your spacecraft why you're willing to take the risk of going to space? Thank you. Dude, that's a molly. I think for me, I oh, yeah. dreamed of going to space from a very young age. I grew up in Houston, another space city, and Her husband's I an was astronaut, exposed by the way. to space on a field trip and got to experience a day in the life of an astronaut and a flight controller and mission control, and I fell in love with the industry. Um, and so I have dreamed yeah. of going to space from a very young age, yeah, but I've happens. also just been so happy and grateful to contribute to it in any way. Um, I think working at SpaceX gives me a tremendous amount of confidence going to space. I see the way they do development. I see the way they handle risks, handle change, handle every piece of the mission, and that just gives me tremendous confidence going forward. I was recently sitting in a simulator and just remembering the entire development effort that went into it, and you've spent I think Anna and I can both agree that you spend a huge amount of your job pretending to be an astronaut and thinking through what they would care about, you know, how the design should come together on the interior. Um, so I think I cannot wait to actually test this in space and bring back knowledge to the engineers from all these little design decisions that we made along the way of what worked well, what doesn't work well, what we should consider for future space flight. Um, but I completely agree with Anna with respect to confidence and flying in the vehicle. The whole process and the, the infrastructure at SpaceX for how we do human spaceflight is immensely confidence inspiring. Um, for me, my husband is actually also a SpaceX engineer and he helped build the propulsion system on our spacecraft. So um, 
I know exactly what goes into the testing and the design and the rigor behind absolutely everything in the spacecraft. So very, very excited to fly on my favorite Dragon spacecraft. Hi, Irene Klotz with uh, Aviation Week and Space Technology. Um, so speaking of your Dragon spacecraft, I think this question is probably for Gers. Um, do you expect to be able to reuse this Dragon after it's been depressurized in orbit? And for you and for Jared, uh, what do you consider the riskiest parts of this mission? Thanks. Yeah, we, we definitely will be able to use this spacecraft again after it's been exposed to vacuum. You know, we initially didn't have the, uh, the chamber test that you got to see in the video. But again, part of our due diligence was, well, what really happens? We took an earlier Dragon to vacuum, and we wanted to see what happened. But we said, why don't we take the current version of Dragon to vacuum and see what happens? And that test <laughs> turned out that it was pretty benign to the spacecraft. It's fine, but it'll be able to be reused again. And then I'll let Jared kind of answer the second part. Well, I, th I, I mean, I think, you know, Gerst already covered it previously. Certainly, if you're going to vent the vehicle down to vacuum and open the hatch, that you are taking on a lot of risk at that point. I think it just goes into the that's, preparation that's for sketchy. that risk that I, I believe have been well mitigated. You know, we, we have manual ways to open the hatch. We have a uh, hatch motor to open or close uh, the hatch. We have redundant seals. Those seals have been, um, you know, uh, um, They've been placed in the hatch with uh, like a, a greater amount of sealant than they, they normally were on, say, like Inspiration4. Um, you know, you have redundancy with uh, two different nitrogen systems. Either one of us, either one, should one fail, can get us back up to a, uh, a habitable environment. You have two different pathways for oxygen. I mean, look, wait, you know, it's like at some point or time or another, if we are to unlock this, this last great frontier and people are going to venture out in space, which by the way, whatever risks associated with it, there is, it is worth it. We have no idea what it could do to really, you know, um, you know again, change the trajectory of, of, of humankind. Um, so like at some point, somebody, you know, kind of, there has to be some first steps in this direction, but they are really well thought out, well mitigated, um, you know, for the benefit of, of, of those that will follow, that will inevitably be doing spacewalks to, you know, build, construct, repair, uh, discover. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it, I, I think, you know, objectively would be the riskiest part of the mission. It's also the one that's received rightfully probably the majority of the last two and a half years of attention. I like Rook. Be like Rook. Uh, Rook's thank cool. You, Ken Kramer from Space Up Close. Yeah, I like him. Uh, Jared, that was I very, very you, well said. Uh, first, I want to thank you for what you did for St. Jude. I'm a pharmaceutical research scientist for many decades making medicines. So I know how important that is, and I know what you contributed, and keep doing it, because you know the public needs it. There's not a lot of understanding in the public for science, so thanks for doing that. So my question is looking a little bit in the future for science. You worked on maybe doing a Hubble repair mission that Bill was involved with, the launches and the, and the uh, repairs. Um, are you thinking about that anymore, any new ideas you might about that you might be able to share with us also want to ask you about the viper nasa has just canceled the viper mission very sadly and they're giving it up is that something you might be interested in taking on it just needs a little hey. bit of testing and uh, any other robotic missions to the moon or mars these are critical missions to help us get to the moon and mars so what are your thoughts <laughs> Appreciate the questions and the, the comments on, on St. Jude, and it, that, that's a huge team effort, by the way. I mean, I think over a million people donated uh, during uh, Inspiration4, which uh, it was that process that ultimately brought us uh, Chris Zimbrowski, who, who joined the Inspiration4 crew. So it's a team effort inside of Polaris, and uh, it's a team effort for everyone who's contributing to, uh, to that important cause. Um, and it's a team effort that goes into everything as it, as it, as it relates to, uh, to this mission. So we're going we're gonna to learn an awful lot um, you know, from, uh, from Polaris Dawn. Uh, it's big, very ambitious objectives. We'll come back with a lot of data. And that's what will ultimately inform uh, you know, the, the second mission. I, I, I think that this journey of creating you know, uh, affordable uh, EVA suits that can be scaled up into mass production is a very worthwhile one. Uh, you know, you, there's going to be an armada of starships arriving on Mars <laughs> at some point in the future, and there's people are going to have to be able to get out of it and, and walk around and, and do important things. Um, 
and that shouldn't, those suits themselves shouldn't cost uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, and the risk associated with things like DCS should be as close to zero. And that's, that's a very ongoing effort by uh, a lot of people. Um, yeah, I, I can't say that I am um, I'm familiar. Uh, I've seen some of the news about the Viper cancellation and such. The last, honestly, um, handful of months have been pretty concentrated on what, what we're trying to do here today. But I will say, like, it, it's a good question because, um, you know, there is a lot that we stand to gain out there, and I think that the private sector, um, you know, investing capital, uh, kind of accelerating this whole world of commercial space is a really, is a really good thing if we want to have a hope of kind of figuring out some of those, those, you know, those questions that we've been thinking about for, for a very long time in our lifetime. So governments aren't always the greatest capital allocators. We can absolutely cheer them on in their great efforts, but it's great to cheer on the private sector too and investments that they can make in order to, you know, unlock this last frontier. So, so anything about Hubble or maybe other robotic science missions you might be interested in. Well, we'll come back from this one and, uh, and see where we go from here, but we, we definitely have a Polaris 2 that'll, that'll be up next. Okay, I hope you think about it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bill Harwood, uh, CBS News, I think for Sarah. I'm going to try to reset yeah, this. A little bit more inside. I'm going to try to reset it, dudes. A lot of us nope. are, you know, remember the NASA Camera's just straight up frozen. Under garments and the 30-minute oxygen supply on the leg and all of those things. What are the thermal constraints that your suit can handle? Can you go out in sunlight? Uh, can you go out in, in dead of night? Um, and how do, you, how do you mitigate the, the thermal extremes you see in space? And how does that figure into when you decide to go stick your head out? Great oh, question. one more. Let me stick in one more before I'll, I'll walk away. Uh, Jared, <laughs> you mentioned uh, the longer tether and all that. We're all, you mentioned Ed White's first space swap with the greatest EVA picture ever taken, I think. Sure is. Um, just for the record, why not go all the way out there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so you know we are. Um, we really started looking at the lessons across the, Dude, the thumbs NASA's up did incredible break portfolio of EVA development over time, and have built the EVA around the objectives we really want to get out of this suit. Um, maybe giving you a little more description of the suit itself. So the suit is fed from oxygen supply in the spacecraft using the umbilical to the suit, and. There are two redundant paths within that. There's a primary path and a secondary path for oxygen. Um, but really, the, the suit has been tested for any environment it can see, from sun exposure to um, extreme dark. There aren't restrictions on when we can actually go outside the spacecraft. Um, we will kind of serially be progressing EV1, go outside, come back in, then EV2, go outside, come back in. Um, so I would say, at this point, the amount of testing is bounding of pretty much any condition we could see in space, as well as much beyond that. Um, so they've tested really, really extreme temperatures, both on the hot end and the cold end in this, in this development effort. Hi, Josh Denner with space.com. Uh, I'd love to hear from the whole crew. This will be SpaceX's first crewed launch uh, since its return to flight after its uh, mishap last month. What was it like to witness that happen, knowing you had a flight coming up? Uh, what went through your head? And as SpaceX engineers, what was it like to know about the problem, see that problem, and, and kind of see how it went about getting solved? I would say SpaceX did an incredible job of keeping us informed every step of the way. You know, within seconds of it happening, we were talking to SpaceX, um, and then we're kept in the loop every single day as SpaceX addressed the problem dug into it, tried to understand what was going on, and very qu quickly thereafter resolved it. So, um, you know, I would say that that was really confidence inspiring. I think, you know, as a SpaceXer, it didn't even surprise me at all. I, this is the way SpaceX does business, and they make sure to look at all of the data, get to the root cause, and then develop all of the fixes mm -hmm. necessary no, to, gotcha. to get to I the other side. So. Um, and so I think it's, it has just been a really confidence-inspiring journey, actually. Yeah, Dude, the and video the encoder process, still sucks. Still stuck. First, it was still stuck. let's address this problem and solve, figure out what's going on. But then, after that, it was let's do a scrub across everything, across the entire Falcon vehicle, across the entire Dragon spacecraft, and think ahead on what could be future failures that we want to think about. Like, what are the other things we might be susceptible that we haven't thought about recently? Um, so completely agree with Anna. It's been incredibly confidence-inspiring um, as they've gone through this effort and kept us informed every step of the way. Communication, competence, 
Completeness and crew is what I can come up with. First <laughs> off, communication, Gerst. Uh, the briefs that he provided us were, were extremely thorough um, and competence is his team that, that solved it. Um, uh, and he was providing us the information all along the way. Completeness, they, they made sure every single element, it just wasn't the issue, it was, it was everything else they went and dug around in the, uh, the, the rocket and the, and the capsule itself. And then uh, lastly, it's the crew. It's relying on these guys' expertise to interpret and provide uh, me some elementary explanation of what's going on. I guess just to layer on, uh, we received phone calls within, I don't know, 30 minutes of the anomaly. Uh, well, mo I think most of us were watching it anyway. Uh, so there, there were already some, some text messages going um, when we saw some of the, the ice forming on it. I think what was in, you know, instantaneous like was, uh, you know, how would, uh, how would the launch escape system that's built into, uh, you know, the vehicle have responded? And, and the reality is we, we, we would have been dropped off in orbit just fine. I did not do a thing. I didn't touch nothing. I didn't touch nothing. My mouse wasn't even on this computer. Dude, he did the thumbs up and the the Apple emoji, the Apple emoji crashed their video encoder. Dude. All right, all right, all right. Clear cache refresh. Here we go. Down to the diagram no. level to the millisecond of exactly stuck. what happened. I didn't um, touch nothing. And then the visuals associated with it, and then retracing all the steps that led to that point. And you're in the loop of that entirely, so that it's like there's no mysteries as to the cause, and then what the fix is, and what's the associated rationale with it. Um, and obviously that's got to be good enough for us, it's got to be good enough for the FAA, it's got to be good enough for every one of the SpaceXers that knows that, you know, they don't want setbacks on the road to Mars, right? Um, so I, I'd say, like, it was all uh, very confidence-inspiring. It didn't matter from, uh, from our perspective whether we were the first launch, you know, after the anomaly when they were cleared to return to flight or the fifth or tenth, like, we were, you know, would have been equally as confident. Discussion uh, about delaying the mission, and if I could ask also, Mr. Isaacman, uh, this will be your second time going to space. Did you bring anything from that experience into Discovery, the training no uh, for this mission that didn't? Hey, we're didn't back, the first and we have the combination. Um, well, I think there. I mean, obviously, the SpaceX did stand down for some period of time, so there there was a delay. Um, you know, but I, I think you know, considering the, this, you know, the situation, we, they got back at it with their missions very quickly, and and we're back at it now with a human spaceflight mission. Um, uh, and again, I think that's really just the amount of data they gather, and you know, the footage they get of it just left no mysteries as to the cause. And if you if you know the cause, then you can put a fix in place. And it's a lot of smart people who are working on it. I also want to just uh, emphasize um, the point that Sarah raised too. You know, being on some of those calls, and you I think most people here know Kiko, who is vice president of um, you know, launch and recovery operations. He, he volunteering up the organization. I've got a few thousand people that are happy to go and check everything else that we think could potentially go wrong in the future while we have this time. So not just staying laser focused on the one particular issue, but what else could potentially haunt us. Let's get ahead of it. So that again, all really. Um, you know, confidence-inspiring. In terms of, like, uh, I, I had a lot of takeaways that are similar to, like, when you go mountain climbing or whatnot. It's, like, should pack less um, on everything. And, uh, and just, I, I think, the idea that, you know, space adaptation syndrome impacts, you know, 50 to 60 percent of astronauts throughout 600-plus people have been to orbit. doesn't matter if you're a hardcore fighter pilot or not. You're just as, you know, just as susceptible to it. So, um, we didn't have a physician assistant traveling on this one, so you had two really, really awesome individuals that logged, I think, a few weeks of emergency room to, uh, time, uh, in addition to academic training and such, to be prepared, uh, you know, from the medical side. Because we want everybody really happy and healthy when we go into day three when we're uh, we're conducting the EBA. Thank you. Hey, Max Evans with NASASpaceFlight.com. Hey. Uh, question for the whole crew. Um, considering how much has been invested from each and every one of you personally and, and professionally over the last couple of years, uh, and also with the uh, historic goals that this mission has for commercial space, how do you think this mission might affect you personally? Good. I guess, you know, I think it will without a doubt impact me. I, it already already has. Um, these last two and a half years have been absolutely impactful in the most incredible way. Um, but I think one way that I am really looking forward to to being impacted is, is the learning. I think that 
like Sarah said, you know, I've spent years trying to put myself in the seat of astronauts in space, and I am really looking forward to learning what firsthand what that experience is actually like, learning as much as I can about our operations, the, the crew experience, um, and bringing that back to SpaceX and human space exploration endeavors. Man, that's a, that's a tough question to answer uh, on a personal level, level. And I think that's exactly it, because anyone could be in the seat. Um, you know, that I'm, I'm sitting in right now. It's, it's, it's a collective effort, and it's bigger than any individual. Um, and it took an entire team uh, to get to where we're at in this mission. Um, and I think that's what makes our, our future so bright with space exploration, is that it will be someone else sitting in these seats in the future. Um, and I'm just thankful to be a part of it with this crew. I... I think there are very few things as impactful as the realization of how many people it takes to do this and how many people we are bringing with us on this journey. Every piece of software, every piece of hardware, um, it, it is a team effort. It's an entire city of people to make this happen. Um, and I think, as Kid said, any of us, anyone could be in these seats and we're incredibly fortunate to be here. But really just hoping to bring back as much as we can to the team and really bring SpaceX along on this journey. Um, it is first-hand learning, as Anna said, um, in support of really ambitious object objectives for the, for the company. So I'm sure we cannot possibly know all the ways it will impact us, um, but very grateful to be here and very excited to bring that back with the team. And I, I feel incredibly lucky to be here as well uh, with a great team and surrounded by so many awesome individuals at SpaceX every day. I find it all quite inspiring. I found it very inspiring when, you know, my journey began, which actually was, it was November 2020. It was the first time I went to SpaceX for, for medical checks. And uh, I tried to come away from all of that experience, essentially those first couple of years of just, uh, or first year, um, you know, being inspired by all the amazing people that I think work at the most innovative organization in the world and say, how do I take that back and professionally grow from this too? and Learn from all that magic that they incorporate every single day. And then being in space and, you know, an unexpected moment where, you know, the moon uh, rose uh, while I was looking at Earth. I didn't expect to see it. And it was just, man, we, uh, we got to just keep this thing going. Uh, you know, my, I wasn't alive when humans walked on the moon. I'd certainly like my kids to see humans walking on the moon and Mars and venturing out and exploring our solar system because as we all know if we're here like we we've barely dipped dipped our toe in the ocean barely i mean we haven't even scratched the surface yet and now you know with reusable rockets and starships on the horizon it's like there's so much to go out and explore and discover uh along the way so i found it i, I found the experience here on earth uh on this you know journey i've been on for about four years to be very inspiring and equally so uh in space i imagine it won't be much different coming back from this one Hi, well, Robinson Smith with Spaceflight Now. Good to see you all again. Um, question for Bill and Sarah, I think, and then I have a follow-up for Jared. Um, with this mission and its profile, is there anything in particular that will be able to port over into the further certification of Crew Dragon beyond its current five flights? And if so, what specific dynamics are those? There's a couple things. The high altitude will give us exposure to the, this high radiation environment which will test a lot of avionic systems and their ability to recover. We build a lot of auto sequences to take care of that for us, but we'll see how it really works. We'll also get a chance to see the laser communication, which I think is a big deal moving forward. And then I think a lot of the suit activities, even though they're not, you know, they're geared more towards mobility. So some of the joints and some of the motion and activities are more geared towards walking on another terrestrial body than they are just doing the EVA. So we're going to learn all that as we move forward. So I think oh, there's yeah? a lot of neat technology that this crew has already helped us learn, but now we're going to actually see them demonstrate in space. So I'm pretty excited about this mission and, and what we're going to learn. Yeah, and I Another think good just to add one Will, thing, dude. there's I like him. one of the things I'm most excited about from this development effort is all of the learnings that are going to go back into Dragon operation. New software features, new, like, how the suits are constructed. There is learning across every single team, materials, 
engineering, you name it, there are, there has been development and there has been lessons learned. Um, one of my favorite things, training crew over crew, is seeing how every single flight gets better and that's what SpaceX does. They take the lessons learned and they immediately incorporate it into future vehicles. Um, so I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to the debriefs to just see that comprehensive look at all the lessons we're gonna be moving into future human space flight. Thank you, and to Jared, um, you mentioned the, obviously the tether is the length that the tether is, but is there an operational reason why you and Sarah are not going fully outside of the Dragon that you can expound upon? Oh, we will be fully outside Dragon. Um, I mean, our, we, we might move up and down uh, as part of a, a translation test, but um, like we'll be well above where the hatch is. Um, we're just maintaining at least, I think uh, we, we have a hands-free demonstration where we'll, it'll only be our feet engaged in a mobility aid. Um, we're just not gonna be just floating around, which I, I think the picture was very cool and it's, it's inspirational. And certainly, you know, the, the Ed White uh, f uh, photo was, is, is historic. But I think as, um, you know, Buzz Aldrin taught us that it, that's not the right way to do an EVA. Um, <laughs> you, uh, you know, it, it takes a lot of effort uh, to move in the suit um, you know, when it's pressurized. I mean, it, it, what, it, what looks like really, you know, like heavy clothing when it's unpressurized becomes super rigid uh, when it's pressurized. So you, you want to like be very deliberate with your movements. You want to make good use of mobility aids. Um, and it was actually a lot of that pioneering work from, from Buzz Aldrin that, you know, set up um, a lot of future EVAs for success. So it uh, looks cool, inspirational, um, which is always part of every one of these missions, but I think we want to learn from, um, from history on this one and try and always maintain at least one point of contact with the mobility aid. Thank you. Okay. I think this will be our final question. Hi there, Kristen Fisher with CNN, and my question is for Gerst. Uh, Gerst, you've spent so many years working in human spaceflight at NASA. You know all too well. Uh, that NASA astronauts are still using the same EVA suits that they've been using for about 40 years. NASA's trying to get new ones, but it's proven to be a challenge for the space agency. And so I'm curious, now that you've shifted over to the private sector, what it's been like for you to watch this rapid evolution of uh, an EVA suit by SpaceX in just under two years? It's a loaded question, but she's got Again, a point. I think it's it's super fun being at SpaceX, and, and as they described, we're really a team. So we leverage off of what we learned from NASA in some ways, and then we push it a little bit further in other areas. And then we share with each other what we know, what we don't know, and we really test and evaluate and make sure we're going forward and doing things the right way. This pace of development that we get to do at SpaceX is very much like the pace of development that was required back in the early Apollo days. We're getting a chance to do that again, where we're really starting to push frontiers with the private sector and learning new things that we would not be able to learn by staying in the risk-free environment of here on Earth. It's time to go out, it's time to explore, it's time to do these big things and move forward. Build base and yeah. wire. <laughs> Let's go. And that concludes our uh, press event. Again, thank you for your attendance, and I think you got to meet an extremely special crew. Follow them during their mission, follow what they're doing, and learn and, and explore just like they're the explorers moving forward. Thank you. Thank Build you. Based Thank you, everyone. Thanks for doing this. That was, that was, that was very informative. We heard from Ken there. <laughs> very, very informative. <laughs> that, uh, that was pretty good, man. It's pretty good. Pretty cool. That's, uh, that's a ballsy freaking mission. That takes some stones to do to do a mission like that. It's uh, gonna launch at three thirty in the morning next Monday. At least that's the tentative date right now. What's the mission? So Yarg, they're gonna launch up in a. Uh, hi, by the way. They're gonna launch up in a Dragon capsule. The Dragon capsule is going to do uh, an insertion uh, one ninety by fourteen hundred apogee at fifty one point six degrees inclined. Uh, that's, that's 1400. That's, uh, let's see. What is that? 900 miles. That's, that's way, way up there. That's, mm, that's a lot. So what, why is this a ballsy mission? It's just going higher, right? Well, they're skirting the Van Allen belts. And then the other thing, that's a lot of radiation, a lot of radiation. The other thing is, um,
there's a lot more micrometeorite debris up there, or micrometeorite on orbit debris, or MMOD for short. The reason why is because anything above like five, six hundred kilometers is nice and stable around Earth. You're not going to get much perturbing effects from Earth's atmosphere up that high. Once you get below like five, five fifty, somewhere around there, that's when you really start hitting the upper parts of the atmosphere enough to perturb your spacecraft or whatever, right? So there's a lot more micrometeorite debris that stays up there which is nuts. I mean, despite what you might think, like looking at a picture of space, right? It's pretty dirty. There's just a, there's a lot of rocks up there. It's a lot of rocks. It's a pretty messy place. Uh, they're going through the South Atlantic Anomaly, which is another ballsy freaking oh, move. Oh, 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 oh hey, Brandon, give this up to Forge. Thank you very much. What's the purpose of attending Dragon up that high? Well, uh, you get some good, you're going to get some good data on potential deep space systems going through the Van Allen belt. The Van Allen belt is there's it's caught radiation as opposed to what you'd get out in deep space, right? It's caught radiation. So our our Earth's magnetic field absorbs a lot a lot of radiation and skirting through that is going to give you kind of it can kind of give you somewhat an analogous uh approximation of what you're going to experience in deep space. <clears throat> and then, after they skirt the upper parts of, or they skirt Mio basically in an eccentric orbit. After that, they bring it down to 700 kilometers, Recovery, which up. is uh, I don't know, like four, 470, 500 miles somewhere in there. Uh, and they're going to do an EVA where they get out of the spacecraft, not exactly like Ed White, but almost like Ed White. It's pretty cool, man. Hey, Solaire, 49 months. Can you answer this for me? For someone who doesn't know numbers, can you draw a picture or something? Yeah, yeah, I will in a second. Um, the other thing that they're going to do is that they have basically... They basically have a piece of a Starlink satellite glued to into the trunk. And they're going to communicate with Starlink by pointing the trunk of the spacecraft through optical communications. They're going to point the trunk at the horizon when they're, when they're floating around, right? And... They, they'll be able to communicate through Starlink, which is pretty cool. Um, that atmospheric cutoff also explains why Vanguard 1 is still in orbit at 654 by 3969. Bingo. Yep, yep. Do you suppose the magnetic field is a solution to radiation in deep space? If we could up our power systems, that's one way to solve that problem. Um, draw me like one of your French diagrams. All right, it is time to bring out the paint. All right, so you have Earth right here. Say, um, give me one second. I'm working on this. All right, so there, there's your crappy, crappy. Earth. Please excuse the crudity of this model. I didn't have time to build it to scale or to or to paint it. Right. So <clears throat> the first orbit that they launch into is going to be something like this. Earth, right? Earth. Welcome to Earth. They're going to be in an eccentric 51.6 degrees inclined orbit. So they're going to launch northeast out of here. And the orbit is going to be going to go way up here and then come back down, float through perigee. And yep, that looks awful. Cool. It's going to go way up here and then come all the way. That still looks bad. Yeah, it's basically a very elliptical style orbit with Earth being like right there. <clears throat> so Apogee is the highest point. Perigee is the lowest point. So if we say 190 by 1400, 190 is down here. 1400 is up here. The reason why that gets pretty crazy is because Earth has a magnetic field around it. The magnetic field kind of does something like this, you know, magnetic north, right? And then there's the upper parts of the magnetic field like this. Where that comes down in the South Atlantic right here is called the SAA, South Atlantic Anomaly. That's a part where the captured radiation in our magnetic field kind of goes further down towards the atmosphere. They're going to skirt through that, which is pretty crazy. Um, 
It's not, it's kind of a Molina orbit, but not. So I, I drew, it was very exaggerated what I just drew. Their track's going to be something like this. It's probably going to look something like that. It's not that exaggerated. Molina would be, an apogee for a Molina orbit would be at like 37,000 kilometers. They're aiming for 1,400. So if we drew it to scale, it would look kind of like this. Like that. It's not very far. But that is pretty damn far for humans. They're just going to basically skirt the bottom of the magnetic field, the Van Allen belts, right? So our Earth's magnetic field keeps our atmosphere here, right? Shields us from being quite actually microwaved by the sun and captures, and because of that, it captures all the radiation in here. And skirting through this right here, right, that point right there, skirting through it, I'll just highlight in red so you can see it skirting through that magnetic field can give you kind of an approximation of what you'd encounter outside of the magnetic field i have my theories it's just my opinion this would have been the question that i've uh, that i was going to ask uh but is this mission to skirt the van allen belts uh getting data for potential deep space missions in the future Deep space refers to anything outside of the Van Allen belts. The last time we went outside of the Van Allen belts was Apollo 16 in December 1972. Now, just in case people are wondering, right, how do how did the Apollo missions do it? Well, they, they went around. They went around the Van Allen belts. The, the majority, actually, they skirted them just like this, believe it or not. Uh, the, the magnetic field is really thick. It's very thick right around the equator kind of looks like that almost and this is where the majority of the crap is the apollo missions when they launched they went around it and went out to the moon right your orbit doesn't bend like that but you get the idea so yeah i personally think that this they're skirting the van allen belts to get some deep space info about how systems react in potentially high radiation environments because going through the van allen belt is like that's, yeah, that's that that could end up be like being worse than what you'd encounter up in space. If anything, it's a good it's a good trial test. It's a good uh, stress test of the systems. That's why this mission is so hardcore. It's really, dude, that's that's, that's a crazy mission. Gemini missions did something like this. The other thing that they're going to try, what I what I heard, if I heard say, uh, if I heard Anna Anna Minon say that correctly, they're going to start spinning the spacecraft and try to induce some type of artificial gravity, not artificial gravity, yeah, angular, angular momentum to simulate a 1G environment or close to it. They're going to do some research on that too, which is actually super cool. Yeah. I was told it sounds like, by saying four humans, sounds like you were talking about how normal it is for aliens. Oh. Yeah, sure. I heard that Earth's electromagnetic field has antimatter trapped into it. And I heard that if my grandmother had wheels attached to her, she'd be a bike. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe we should go check. <laughs> I don't know, dude. I don't know what you want me to do with that. Maybe we should maybe we should go up there and find out. Just saying. Bikes. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's pretty cool. And I know I know what people are gonna say. Like, how are they gonna communicate with Starlink if Starlink is down at 500 kilometers? If Starlink's down here, well, if the spacecraft is going around like this, right? They can point Dragon's trunk backwards and hit and supposedly get at the Starlink satellites that are coming up over the horizon. So, like, if the dragon's right here, and say you have a Starlink that's in an orbit like this, right? A circular orbit at 51, right? Dragon can just point backwards, and it should be able to get one over the horizon. You should be able to communicate that way. From what I understand, SpaceX basically duct-taped a, a Starlink satellite into the trunk of that dragon. Or at least the optical communication components of that, which is actually super cool. Uh, that's actually a pretty righteous mission. That is something that's going to be super needed in the future, guys. 
Optical communication in space is great because you're in the vacuum. You just beam light. Light will just go on forever. We know that because the sun is very far away from us and we still see the sunlight. So you can, you can, optical communications are the future of how we're going to be moving. Like, you know, radio signals are all fine and dandy, but that's short band, right? Like, that's not going to, that's not going to get very far. Optical can go very far, but it is highly directional too. Short bands is kind of an AOE, if you will, but it's only, it only really works at short ranges, right? You know, if you're using optical, you can go very far, but you have to, it has to be highly directional, like Starlink's. It's, it's very, very much directional. You miss by even a degree, you're screwed. You're not going to get any communications. Shotgun versus a sniper rifle. That's a good way to say that. Yeah, pretty much. I'm guessing they'll have line of sight to the ISS at certain times from orbit. Uh, that's come, I do not think it is a coincidence that they're in a 51.6 degree inclined orbit. That's not a coincidence. Um, that gets them redundant backups for Tidris, uh, just in case. Um, if they need to use NASA's communications, if the Starlink one doesn't work out, that also puts them, if something goes wrong, they can get near the ISS for not a lot of Delta V comparatively. I don't think that's an accident. That's absolutely on purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are different types of radiation. There's all kinds of stuff up there, dude. It's all kinds of radiation up there, and it's not good for you. Spoiler alert. You know, you're going to get a tan. If you go up there without the proper protection, you know what I'm saying? Wear sunscreen. And by sunscreen, I mean a spacesuit. It's freaking cool, though. Um, this mission is amazing, dudes. I can't believe I'm seeing a mission like this. I cannot believe I'm seeing a mission like this in my lifetime funded entirely by private stuff. And somebody did say it in chat. And I, Cloppy, you said it in chat if you're out there. I, I agree with you. NASA should be doing this with the Orion capsule as well. Yeah, there, I said it. Let's just get that out of the way. Um, I hope the woman understand the risks. Dude, Sarah and Anna are not stupid. They are not stupid. They helped design the damn spacecraft. I think they understand the risk, homie. Yeah, though those two are very, very smart. <laughs> way smarter than me, man. <laughs> like, way smarter than me. I'm just the guy that sits here and play video games all day. You know? <laughs> But EJ, that would require NASA to actually care about getting stuff done. Oh, dude, I didn't ask to be cut deep today. Why'd you got to do that? That cuts deep. Well, Orion should be launching more than once a year. NASA should be ha should be using Orion for ISS rotation to test the damn capsule. You guys know. You guys know. Well, actually, I was about to say Orion shares similar thruster design to Starliner, but that's not right. It's um, it's ATV derived. So no, not exactly. But Orion does share a thruster, share a thruster with the um, with the space shuttle. The AJ-10 is a space shuttle orbiter maneuvering engine, so you might you know you might want to check that. And is 38 Cherokee, dude. Her her husband's an astronaut, you know. Anil, Anil Minon, Anna and Anil. Yeah, Anil is, a, is an astronaut, and she's a SpaceX engineer, and they're they're both they both get to fly. Into, that's you know that's like I'm not trying to say that's like power couple action, but it's some pretty power couple. That's pretty cool. That's 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 pretty dope. That's pretty dope. All right, well you know Primo and I are both nerds, so there's that. <laughs> yeah. When was the date ish for Polaris Dawn? No dates, Isep. Yeah, yeah, Forge, exactly. Yep, yep. Sure beats the hell out of us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you ain't kidding, Fred. You ain't kidding, man. Starliner shared the shuttle thrusters, but Orion doesn't. No, Orion's uh, reaction control systems are are, are derived from the European uh, automated transfer vehicle. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, Polaris 2 is going to build off of Polaris Dawn, which is pretty cool. And then Polaris 3 is a crewed starship flight, which is... Uh, you know what, man? I, I want NASA to have parity. I want to, you know, I want all that stuff. You've heard me talk 
bajillion times about how I think NASA needs to have parity with SpaceX. If if Starship gets a human rating certification, that's nail in the coffin stuff. Just saying. Just put it out there. That's that's nail in the coffin. Like you're you're screwed. <laughs> yeah, that's that's that would that pretty much makes Orion like not useful at all. Yeah. Eight more crew starship job postings went up today, including the first ones at Starbase. <sighs> the coffin already has nails. We're not talking about welded and shut. Yeah, it's uh, not ideal. Yeah. Senior propulsion engineer for crew starship. Dude, I... That's what needs to pull their head out of their culo. You guys understand? Pull your head, pull your cabeza out of your culo. Do you understand that? Do you understand that one, pussycats? That's uh, kind of important. I've been told we have a NASA rant on the way. I'm not saying nothing, Mike. I'm not saying nothing. Starship gets human rating certification. Why even use Orion? What's the point? Like, and I'm saying that as a huge advocate for SLS and Orion. Like, I've, I've always said they need to launch more. This is why they need to launch more. There's no justification there. I mean, we do we would have two redundant human-rated ways to get to the moon. I do appreciate that. But also, the, the optics are ridiculous. Like, like, you can't argue with how this looks, right? Like... I got nothing to say. Like, I want SLS to launch more. I want it to launch more. Launch it more. Please launch it more. Stop launching it less. Stop doing that. Please stop doing that. <laughs> you know? Small question related to the preparation for suit pressure. Does it mean that in case of emergency, the current spacesuit can, cannot be used? Well, they have, they have the flight suits, Pados, and then they have the EVA suits. Um, they'll probably slowly bring the pressure down in the capsule over time, uh, and then don the EVA suits during a mission. That's like saying a Cessna 150 run is a redundant backup for a 747. Is Orion really redundant backup? For Yarg, in the interim, sure, in the interim. But, well, yeah, like, you know, that's... <sighs> Yeah, in the interim, it'll be fine. But, dude, if Starship gets a human rating certification from NASA, like, I don't think, I don't think, dude, I don't think, I don't think they'll do it. If Starship, dude, if, if Rook takes that sucker into Leo, does a Polaris Dawn with a Starship, comes back down and lands it, and they catch the damn thing on the pad. Why the f do you have Orion? Like, what's the point? There's redundant dissimilar architecture. You could make the argument there. I think that would be a fair thing, a fair argument to make. But also, yeah, you, one's a Cessna, the other one's a 747, man. Like, it's like saying a Huey is the same as a C5. It's just, it's just not how that works. What happens if they can't repressurize? They have tanks inside of the capsule that they could repress with, goalie. Is your gain high? You're not so clear as you used to be. Um, yeah, I will... I can turn my gain down locally over here and balance the sound out on my super awesome soundboard. Like, I, I just... I'll say it right now. Like I said, as a huge advocate for SLS, NASA needs to get their head out of their tail. You need to get your head out of your culo now because, you know, you think you have justification for SLS here. By the end of this decade, SpaceX is going to be flying around people in that thing. Man, you're going to look stupid. Yeah, now they had the cabeza up the culo. You understand? Yeah, comprende? Comprende, amigo? Cabeza en the culo. Like, you did, they, they, 
You need to fix this, like, now, or else you're gonna have a big problem in the future. Cabeza en culo. Like, culo. All the way up to the bokeh, you know what I'm saying? Now that in Japanese. Ohayou gozaimasu. Kyo wa ramen no sukudemasu. Katashimi desu ne. Hasimashou. Be right back. I'll go do that. <laughs> Please stand clear of the doors. Por favor, mantengase cerrado de las puertas. On behalf of the cast of the I'm Going to Sue You Resort, welcome to the Sue You Now. Gesundheit. Ah, danke. No, I'm not, Ernok. That was real Japanese. <laughs> anyway that was awesome this is going to be such a cool mission i'm going to be here for it it's the, the launch is tentatively 3 30 in the morning don't care i'm here for it once starship starts to fly crew and the ships start getting names can we refer to the flight deck as the bridge and the commander as the captain I, I I don't see why not. What day? It's a it's a week from now, Monday. Uh, Yargnet on Monday. Discovery. I was Go about to call up. you Monday and call Monday Yargnet because my brain is overloaded with how cool this actually is. That time sucks. Well, they said that that launch window is basically constrained based off of minimalization of MMOD of micrometeorite impacts, which tells me there's asteroids. There's a shower, there's some parts of higher or medium Earth orbit that have more risk of MMOD. There's basically clusters of crap up there and there's cleaner spots. Uh-oh, sounds like someone's got a case of the Yorgnets. Is that the real Beth? Oh, yeah. Dude, S, I... You actually reminded me. I watched that the Tim Dodd video uh, of of him going through what did i tell you guys three or four new glens in the pipe man did i call that i'm not trying to say you know i was right but i was pretty damn right yeah also jeff bezos would make an excellent science teacher like an excellent science teacher he explains stuff really really well like i'm kind of impressed I'm, I, dude, his way, his way of explaining stuff is real good. Dude, the Merritt turbo pump. Yeah, two-stage turbo pump actuator with, uh, on, on the B, on the B3, which is, that's pretty trick. Dude, that's some, dude, I'm telling you, I told, I've just saved it. I've said they've been cooking for like five years, man. Not too many spoilers. Yeah, Blackness said, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Jeff is very, he is amazingly good at explaining things. The way he was, ex dude, I couldn't explain some of that stuff better. I'm serious. He's, his, the way he was talking about it, he knows, he knows what he's talking about. That engine is near an RL-10 in its first generation. Dude, it's past an RL-10. RL-10s on a good day make north of 100 kilonewtons. That thing makes 500 kilonewtons of thrust off of an expander cycle. 500 kilonewtons off of, and that's not spoilers blackness just in case 500 kilonewtons and there's two of them new glenn's upper stage is a freaking s4b on steroids like <clears throat> did you cover the news that elon wants to take over the duties of launching dream chaser tenacity with falcon instead of ula uh why would he want to do that yeah, Ordon, the guy's a freaking nerd. I, dude, I've said it. I, you know what, man? Like, here's the thing. All right, you know, Jeff gets a lot of crap. Elon gets a lot of crap. I, no doubt. Like, all these guys get a lot of crap. Now, Richard Branson gets a lot of crap too. I mean, you know, that's fine. But you know, I know a nerd when I see one. I know a nerd when you see one. Like, you hear Elon talk about Starship. You hear Jeff talk about New Glenn. You could tell these dudes are into it. They know. That they're into it, man. Like you could, it's so easy to see it, right? 
Yeah, no, you know a nerd when you see it. Jeff was geeking out over the carbon fiber tool wrapping fairings, and I, I frankly don't blame him. I'd be sitting there going, <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. I like that. That's good, yeah. <laughs> you know? Have you been able to quantify MMOD in specific orbits? To an extent, Azai, you can't, you can't track all of it, but Space Force does that. Space Control Squadrons are doing that, dude. Yeah, the Space Force is what catalogs that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And those duties were drastically expanded from SPD-3. Space po no, SPD-1. Space Policy Directive 1 in 2018. They drastically expanded uh, the, you know, by making the Space Force... Uh, uh, space control squadrons and observations. Oh, yeah. They, that's the kind of stuff they track. Oh, yeah. And space flight meteorology, too. That's that's the Space Force. That's a little bit of NOAA and a little bit of NASA, too. Oh, yeah, dude. Oh, yeah. Space, look up uh, look up Delta Control Squadron. Space Force Delta Control Squadrons. Or uh, Space Control Squadrons. That's what they do. They're, they Dude, these are space... Like, I'm not trying to advertise for the Space Force, but also, this is a sweet freaking job. Uh, you sit there and you look through the telescope all day and you just track debris and stuff. They track like on orbit debris, busted up stages. You know, that's to minimize your uh, chances of micrometeorite impact or collision and, and collision avoidance during launch. That's all taken into account for every single launch, guys. The, the possibility of minimalizing hitting another satellite, hitting debris hitting a glove that somebody left up there from an EVA. Oh yeah, that's what the Space Force does. And before them, the Air Force Space and Missile um, Center. Yeah, it was rolled into the, its own thing because we launched more stuff into space, dude. They track everything, dude. They can track, they can track the gloves with their radars, man. Radars and telescopes, oh yeah. They, once you get something a little bit below like 30 centimeters, it starts to get a little difficult. But yeah, they can track all kinds of cool stuff. And this isn't like, this isn't like, they don't, I mean, they're tracking, this is like, just to make sure our satellites are okay. Like, you don't want the ISS getting showered like it did in gravity. That's the kind of stuff they do. 100% you worked in the 90s, I've seen the system person that tries, dude, it's so cool, Crunch. That's like, man, if I would, dude, if I was 18, I'd be doing that right now. I'd be like, yo, Delta me, baby, let's do it. Hey, Toydee, 94 months. Go at throttle up. Yeah, they, dude, they, they got some pretty trick stuff, man. Some pretty trick stuff. I, I, you know, I don't know the details to it because, frankly, if I did, I'd probably be in jail. <laughs> Let's be real. Uh, but this is the kind of stuff you don't kind of, you know. Uh, but also, it's they can track whatever. They've tracked gloves. They've tracked all kinds of cool things. Did you catch the bucket of hydrogen comment that when they were talking about propellant densities? In Tim's video. No, Titan had to take a dump halfway through it, so I think I missed that, but... Hmm. Yeah, like tracking a tool a toolbox. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they lost the damn toolbox. According to NASA's site, they could track down to three millimeters with ground-based radar. It's below one millimeter if they... Below one millimeter, they have to start estimating. Yeah, Fred, it's pretty good, man. Yeah. Uh, Tigris, you have regular, right? Tracking space debris sounds a little like watching a 3D spreadsheet all day. I mean, how's he cataloging debris and stuff, man? That's cool. I think that's neat. Uh, Tigris, let me, let me just make sure you got regular. Yeah, post it up, dude. But yeah, this Polaris Dawn mission is pretty damn cool, dude. Oh, you got gifted a oh, sub. Oh, oh, this is space. What I'm video in space. is this? Oh. Tigris did. No. No. That. That. That's. 
That's a clickbait channel, dude. Yeah, I'm not even... I'm zapping that link, dude. Sorry. That's that's a clickbait channel. That there I haven't heard anything about that other than that channel. That's that's Dude, don't don't get information from there. That 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 channel sucks. Yeah, don't you don't yeah, you don't 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 get information from there. The question becomes how much of this is based off speculation? What's your source? I made yeah, no, that's don't don't give that guy clicks. That frick that guy. Like, you know, I'm not one to be like, hey, don't follow this, don't follow that. You know, just because I don't like what their reporter says. Like, you guys know that I'm not they're they're you know I I'm not that big of a fan of some space flight reporting, but I don't say don't follow them either. You know what I mean? That one don't follow. Don't follow that. No, don't do that at all. No, that's yeah. It looks like an AI channel. Yeah, we've... Yep, but that's... Um, yep, that's the idea. Anyway. But yeah, that's uh, good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, the, the Player Stone stuff, not the clickbait channel. Hey, Doom, what's going on? What are you doing over in YouTube chat, dude? You lost? You lost? You know, grab. That looks like it. You know, I'm I'm kind of wondering, like, what if you did it? What if you did a channel like that, but actually had reliable news? You think that channel would get views? When do you get that contact lens? They're gonna wear. I don't know, but that thing is cool. They're monitoring interocular activity, which is pretty cool. That's a little bit beyond my expertise, but yeah, I know that your eyes get screwed up in space. Yeah, there you go, Ordon. I clicked on the notification, but it was from YouTube. I'm back in the right place. I was going to say, what are you, lost, man? <laughs> Dude, that's, uh... Man, that Polaris Dawn stuff really made me happy. Of course it wouldn't get views. Real life is boring compared to ULA Dover for realsies. Dude, Steve, the... F I, I flipped on the local news, because that's what I do. It's part of my morning routine when I'm, you know, making coffee and eating breakfast and feeding the dog in the morning, right? Flipped on the no local news. First thing I hear on the local news. Starliner is stranded in space. Astronauts might have to stay there until February 2025. I'm like... Oh, didn't need that on this Monday morning, man. What the frick? You know? I'm like... Why don't you just report what's going on? Damn it. <laughs> Did you throw the coffee mug into the TV? No. Brimo was in her office in the next, like the room over from the living room. And she heard it. And she just starts Everybody, laughing. No I'm just sitting there like, that's not funny. That's not funny at all. <laughs> Why? Why? No, you wouldn't be able to keep up with the people who don't care. And viewers who did care would be spooked away. Oh. I mean, kind of want one of those one million view videos, Aqualux. Even even one or two videos with like a million views on YouTube would really, really do me right. Not going to lie. I could use an extra 50 Gs today. Could you? Yeah. Might be worth it for the memes. But actually, you know, actually have factual info and make sure that you talk the voiceover like this. SpaceX is looking to launch something into space. Space Exploration Technologies Incorporated is looking to launch Polaris Dawn into space with Jared the Rook Isaacman into space and Scott Kid Pote. They're looking to launch into space on this day. Like, it's, I could do the fake voiceover. We could do the AI voice. I could do that. That'd be that'd be funny. Beep boop. I am a robot. <laughs> All your space are belong to us. Yep. I had explained to my mom what was really going on one evening, and she asked about it after seeing it on the news. I get asked that every day now by all my neighbor's mouse. No joke. Not gonna lie, when I first turned in, you were covering a new SpaceX man mission. I thought it might be an official announcement of them bringing home the Starliner. 
I had to explain him. Yeah, jeez. Oh, gosh. Thank you for providing logical info. What you say? You have no chance to survive. Make your time. Ha 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 ha. That's the way you have to do it. Have you in the corner faking the egg? <laughs> should I do that? I want to do that. We should do that. That'd be awesome. <laughs> I don't get why people are using those robotic voice when you have so much better AI voices now. Yeah, what S said, it's funny. <laughs> I would do it like that the entire time just for fun. <laughs> people, you think, you think that would piss someone off? I think that would piss someone off. I don't know how, but you could stub your toe and it would piss somebody off on the internet. You know what I mean? Why aren't you wearing shoes? Because I'm barefoot. Why are you barefoot? Did you know that some people don't have shoes? It's like, what? Would absolutely be unsurprised if the next CRS Dragon mission gets upgraded to six seats. Marius, they're not going to do that. That increases that increases too much risk. The capsule isn't rated for the capsule isn't rated for um, for six people. It's not. It's just not. I know that SpaceX has advertised that it could launch up to seven. But going down that road, especially with a customer mission, remember NASA's a customer for SpaceX, is too risky for NASA and it's too risky for SpaceX. Remember, we're time constrained here, okay? Doing the research and development that you need to put two more seats in could get a little complicated because remember, those four Dragon seats on Dragon, they rotate. They rotate. So what, what are you going to do when they rotate back down when they come into land? The people, Two people will be stuck underneath there. Now, I'm not saying... That you couldn't either at the same time they could just get those crew out first right and then rotate the seats down and go but understanding the methods behind doing that takes time it takes time they could sure but remember this is a time sensitive issue because starliner can only spend so much time up there before the next dragon needs to launch you don't have enough time to just bolt two more seats in on dragon without being very without it being very risky you don't want to clown car your spacecraft that would be a bad idea that's more risky than uh that's more risky than anything. That that would be just as risky as them coming down on Starliner. Think about it, dude. You got to you got to kind of put yourself in their shoes, you know? Everything everything down to like tightening a bolt on the spacecraft is documented because there's so many things that can go wrong if you didn't document like uh oh, I don't know, dropping your life support system on the ground and then put it in the spacecraft anyway, it could blow up. That's what happened during Apollo 13. You know, they had cracks in the O2 tank with the Teflon seals because someone dropped the damn life support system before they put it in. They dropped it and said... <clears throat> I mean, it was a little more complicated than that, but that was the gist of it. That's what started the cascading failure, right? They did design it for up to seven seats. They advertised it for seven seats. Remember that. It's rated for four differences. You could fit seven people in a pickup truck if you put two people in the cab and everybody and five people in the bed. Does that mean it's rated for five people? Nope. But you could. A little risky, right? Do you think SpaceX has a has trained in a seven seat configuration? No, not at all. Why? There's no customers for it. Why would they do that? It's you got to be careful with this stuff, man. Very careful. That I would just I think the best way to do it would just be to launch uh, launch crew like if you were if Starliner is not an option for coming back down for Butch and Sunny, two seats on the Dragon, launch two people and have them do just an ISS a standard ISS rotation. Right, and then have them come down in February. That is the safest way because you're not all you. The, the the downside to that is that you bump two astronauts to the next mission. No big deal. You don't want to change the way you go uphill and downhill. That's a very bad idea. Now, the reason why that would suck is because it would really open up kind of a lot of questions to whether Starliner is certified for bringing crew up and down. You've only completed half of the mission. I don't think that would necessarily mean the Starliner mission is a mishap by any means, but 
failing to receive certification would probably put a damper in future ISS logistic operations. It could have repercussions down the road. So they have hard data showing it can be done safely if the need comes up for it. Who does, Yarg? They're going to, if, if Lord Gugu, if they do have Butch and Sonny come down on Dragon, they'll launch spacesuits for them. I don't know what they're going to do with the Starliner suits, but yeah. But yeah, anyway. Flares Dawn, baby. Pretty good stuff. Shall we, Kerbal? All right, let's roll. We have some texturing work to do. So we're going to do part four of... Uh, part four of working on texturing this part. We'll talk more about this during Space News. Should happen around 5 p.m. And then I don't know what we'll do for after hours. I have workers teed up, but I might go back to Kerbal because the Polaris Dawn press conference kind of bumped the work that we were going to do. So we'll see what happens. Um, and we'll go from there. Uh, let's go... Texturing a part for KSB. 